Pray with me, would you? God, would you be with us now? Would you feed your people whom you love, whom you died for? Um, And would your truth be proclaimed by your Spirit? It's in your name we pray. Amen. So um, I want to welcome any guests that we might have this morning. Um, I'm Pastor Nate Thompson. I'm one of the pastors here at Southside Bible Church. For those of you who are familiar with uh, Ken Murphy, I am not Ken Murphy. I don't look that good. Um, So I uh, thank God that uh, uh, Ken's able to be with his wife this morning at a a conference and support her. Um, So uh, would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy um, chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 18 and 19, and these will mainly serve as a springboard into a larger uh, topic this morning, dealing with the conscience. As you're turning there, I would just like to introduce with a small anecdote. It says, a a shoplifter wrote to a department store saying, I've just become a Christian, and I can't sleep at night because I feel guilty. So here's $100 that I owe you. He signed his name and then added a P.S. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. (laughs) So our consciences are uh, things that sometimes we misunderstand. In this case, this is an example of someone misunderstanding it as if he could will it to bend to what he was thinking. So recently, we have uh, closed in our study of the book of, uh, well, chapter 14 of the book of Romans. And if you, some of you might recall that Ken said what, I want, what he wanted to do was dedicate an entire Sunday to talking about the conscience, to having a better understanding, what is the conscience? Um, how does it function? Well, that's why I'm standing before you this Sunday uh, to do that breakdown and to invite you back, as Sean uh, did already, to tonight to go over, uh, to have a Q&A session on any questions you might have. And I would imagine with what we're going to be covering, uh, you probably will have questions. And, and we invite those questions. We invite you to come and ask them. Um, if you can submit them online, that might give us um, a little more time to think about them as opposed to having to shoot from the hip. But uh, God is sufficient. We are not. So we'll We'll go with that. Um, so this morning, sermon will involve a lot of technical information. And the downside to technical information, one is that it might put you to sleep. And I don't want to do that. So I did uh, load up a slide deck. So hopefully that will help. So I've got pictures for you. I did not bring the pop-up book, but we'll go with what we got. Um, but that also said, if if it's just education that we're doing this morning, then I fail. Because that's not what this is about. I'm not here to educate you. I'm here to help you grow in Christ. I'm here to point you to Him. And I'm here to help you live into the glorious reality that we have in the conscience and keeping a good one in Christ. So that's the goal. So our main theme this morning is going to be keeping a good conscience. That's going to be our main theme. And it's, it's going to take us a few steps to get there. So please labor with me in that. So I want to start us off by focusing our attention here to why this is important. And I want God to speak to us and, to, and he be the one to tell us it's important. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It says... This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, and that by them you fight the good fight. And how is he going to do that? Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. So I want the gravity of this passage to land on us we do see that it is important for us to keep faith. 
I think any Christian would understand that it's important for us to keep good faith. But how many of us think about keeping a good conscience? And yet he puts them in parallel to one another and says, by rejecting these, people have shipwrecked their faith. Shipwrecked their faith. So I don't want us to exclude keeping faith. I want us to include keeping a good conscience. And for us to understand what it is to keep a good conscience, um, we're going to need to break down what's, what's the conscience. Where is it? How does it function? Whose is it? Um, so we will look at that, but I want to remind you that, that Paul, twice, Acts 23, 1, 1 Timothy 1, 5, talked about keeping a good conscience. You know who else also mentioned keeping a good conscience? The Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter 3, 16 and 21, he talked about keeping a good conscience. The writer of Hebrews. You can debate who that is. It's not the point. But whoever the writer of Hebrews is, begs his readers to pray for him that he might keep a good conscience. That's in Hebrews 13, 18. It's consistent. It's consistent. So this morning, um, would you go ahead and uh, pull up the slide deck for me, gentlemen, with the first slide? Thank you. Um, we're going to cover the conscience, and where we're going to start is where it is. Then that'll help us with what it is, whose it is, then we're going to uh, we're going to have means by uh, how to define it, and then we're going to talk about how it works, how it functions, and then to get to our main point, how to keep it in a good standing, how to keep a good conscience. That's what we're going to do. So, slide two, please. I want us to understand that we are created in the image of God which means we are both body and spirit. We are material and immaterial together. That's Genesis 1.26, we are created in the image of God. John 4.24, um, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So we are both body and spirit. Well, where does it talk about the body? We'll remember Paul in Philippians 1.21 through 24 talking about He's wrestling whether I should stay on in the flesh or go and be with the Lord, right? So he's showing that there's two things there. And what, lest we uh, wonder what that flesh is, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 gives us clear definition that when he was saying flesh, he was meaning body, physical body. So we are a combo and we are uniquely created this way, body and spirit, material and immaterial. No other creation of God's is made this way. We might like our dogs and might say all dogs go to heaven, but that's not the case and all cats go to hell or whatever it is that you <laughs> guys feel. But the reality is they don't contain spirits. They, um, they're great. They're here for our pleasure to pet and love and, and we can think that they're our best friends. But the fact is, we were created to relate to God. And we were created to relate to God in spirit and in truth. And, and so there's this whole breakdown. And I, I want you to see, I broke down body and brain, and I want you to see the difference between brain and mind. So I want, I want you to see those are on two different things. One's in the material, one's in the immaterial. And, and usually we talk about the brain as if it are, is our mind. It's not. If uh, you might recall in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, there are some uh, saints who have been killed. They're dead. And what are they doing? They're, they're slain, and they're at the throne, and they're communicating. They're experiencing emotion. They are listening. They know things. They have self-consciousness. They're thinking creatively. They, they're interpreting things. Then they're relating to and responding to God, and they're worshiping God. All things that we usually attribute to just our brain. But it's actually, these are attributes of the mind. The brain is just a physical expression or physical manifestation. It's a gateway. You can think of it as a window by which we communicate to this physical world. But the actual thought, our actual thought life is not in the brain. Our actual thought life is in the mind, which is in the immaterial part of man. 
also in 1 Samuel 28, 11 through 19, we see Samuel dead and communicating with Saul, the King Saul, because he's really disturbed and he needs some help. And so he gets this medium to call up Saul, uh, Samuel and, and is surprised to see when Samuel actually shows up. And Samuel converses with Saul and he relates to Saul and he recognizes Saul. He communicates to Saul. And where's his physical body? He doesn't have one. He doesn't have a physical brain. But what does he have? He's got his mind showing us that he has a mind. Uh, Luke 16, 19 through 31, that parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, it's a debate whether or not it's a parable. I'm not here to debate that this morning. You want to ask about that, the Q&A session, fine. We can do that. But uh, this is about the rich man and Lazarus. You, you might recall both of them die. And what do they do? They, both of them are experiencing either pain or pleasure. Both of them are making value judgments and assessments. Both are, are dead. They don't have a physical brain, but what do they have? They got a mind. They have a mind because their immaterial being is with, well, is in the eternal. Let's put it that way, is in the eternal state. And that means either eternally separated from God or eternally with God. So um, just a kind of a side note, if you would. What makes us human, what makes us human is, is not that we are, are um, anthrop anthropods that can walk and we think better than the dolphins. That's not what makes us human. What makes us human is that we are the combination of the material and the immaterial. That's what makes us human. Jesus Christ was the perfect human. When you and I die, we will finally be perfect humans. What else would we be? We're not angels. We don't become angels. We'll be humans as we were originally created to be. That we will be perfect body, um, no longer with this entropy, degradation, so we will be perfect humans. So what doesn't make us human is being full of faults, making sinful choices and mistakes. That's not what makes us human. And here's why. I want us to understand how severely making that kind of a statement is. Because who else was human? Jesus was human. So either we're going to have to say Jesus wasn't fully human. John 1.14 would disagree among many other texts. Or we would have to say that Jesus made mistakes and sinned and was imperfect just like us. Well, 1 John 1, 1 through 5 would disagree, as would a lot of other texts. So it's not being mistakes and sin-ridden that makes us human. It's being material and immaterial that makes us human. And one day, as I said, thank God, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection and we will be perfect humans. Perfect humans. What makes us sinful, folks, is not this body. And it's not even the exposure to, this, to a sin-cursed world because Jesus was, was exposed to the same thing. What makes us sinful is the sin that dwells within us. Romans 7, 17 through 20. And sometimes those sinful choices have physiological effects. Psalm 32, verses 3 through 4. And we can use our physical bodies either for righteousness or unrighteousness. Romans 6, 12 through 14. It's a tool. This physical body is a tool. Will you use it for good or will you use it for evil? So guys, being human, that's not our problem. Being sinful, that's our problem. That's, and the solution is found in Jesus Christ. So next slide, please. So we want to talk about where is the conscience? What is the conscience? Whose is the conscience? So what we're doing is we're zooming in on that immaterial aspect in this slide deck. And in this immaterial aspect, you might see that we're talking about the heart. Um, we could also use the term spirit or soul. Um, a lot of these terms are used very interchangeably throughout the scriptures. 
Uh, as one example, in 1 Peter 2.11, we pursue holiness in our soul. In 1 Corinthians 7.34, we pursue holiness in our spirit. And in Proverbs 20, verse 9, we pursue holiness in our heart. So we're seeing just a, a similarity there with the use of these terms. We're going to use the term heart this morning. Uh, it's the one we most frequently use from the pulpits and in our teaching. We talk about heart and, and that the heart needs to be right with God, that the heart needs to commune with God. So, so that's the term we're going to use is heart. So we've got a nice little picture of what you and I uh, envision when we think of heart, and, and that's not even the way it's shaped in our physical body, right? It's this weird thing that... Anyway. So this is just to help give us an image, and I've broken it out into these four different categories of our immaterial heart, and you can see mind, and so this breakout with this, these little arrows is talking about mind and what the mind does in the human heart. What the mind does uh, in passages like Matthew 16, 23, Acts 7, 22, and 23, Romans 1, 28, Romans 12, 2. Don't worry, this is recorded. You can go back and listen to it again and get all these passages. Um, we see how decisions of the mind drive our immaterial emotions. I'm not talking about our physiological emotions. Usually when people think emotions, they think about how it feels in my body physiologically. That's different. That's, that's just things running through your physiology. We're talking about chosen emotions. The mind drives those chosen emotions. The mind also drives, if you saw that other arrow, down to the will. It drives our will. As we think, to make, as we think, we, we begin to make decisions. That's the volition. That's the will. All right? Slide four. So you bring that up. When we see the will and how the will works, there it is, all right? The will, as we make decisions, will drive our immaterial emotions. Um, a great example of this is um, in uh, Ephesians 4, 25 through 27. People like to go to this passage to talk about anger. Anger is, in that text, it's, it's a command. Be angry and do not sin. Oh, that's different. Well, that's, if it's a command... That's an act of volition or an act of the will. Do this. It's actually, actually a statement. Do this. Be angry. And the question should be asked, be angry about what? It's be angry about the truth. Um, it's, it's godly anger. And then we're given premises around that. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Again, they're volitional statements. So we see the will driving the immaterial emotions there. Um, in, uh, in the next slide... We see um, emotions or the immaterial emotions. Things don't start in, um, in our emotions, uh, but as we have immaterial emotions that can drive further thought and consideration and then drive further decisions. And sometimes those, those decisions are not are, are good ones or bad ones. We, think, we see immaterial emotions in, in passages like Philippians 2, 1 through 2. Um, first Thess and 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, when Paul is talking about a fond affection for, for the people of the church. Was he, is he just talking about a warm, fuzzy feeling in his body? Boy, I feel all warm and fuzzy when I think about you. And, you know, for those of us who are married, you probably did feel warm and fuzzy when you met your spouse, and that's great. But that's not what we're talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about something deeper. It's in the heart. It's an immaterial emotion. Right? And the number four, go ahead and go to the next slide, might kind of surprise you as, well, wait a minute, I've always heard about mind, emotions, and will. Yes, you have, and it doesn't make it wrong. But usually, when we talk about mind, emotion, and will, they are in the heart. But what about the conscience? Well, the conscience is there too. The conscience is in the heart. It's not a little Jiminy Cricket-shaped thing in your brain, right? Where, I'm your conscience. No, it's actually in your immaterial heart. And what does it do according to Romans 2, 14 and 15? It helps, so it's, a, it's, it's acting in a way that it's viewing what we're thinking and then it's going to drive our thoughts in direction of, oh, that was a good thought or that wasn't a good thought. That was right or that was wrong. And since it was right, 
I'm, I'm going to stimulate good emotions, um, uh, immaterial emotions. Uh, it was not right. I'm, I'm going to lead you down the path of feeling something you're not going to like, mainly guilt, fear. We'll talk more about that as we move on. So um, a point of clarification here. The conscience is not the Holy Spirit. The conscience is not the Holy Spirit. Um, we see it very clearly in Romans 9.1. Um, we can go ahead and turn there if you want, uh, just so you can see it. Uh, here's Paul, the Apostle Paul. He says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. So you see the separation of these two things. So his conscience is clear on what he's about to say. And what he's about to say is he longs for his brothers, those who are Jews, those who are of the nation of Israel to come to Christ. He longs for that. And he's saying, I'm not lying. My conscience is bearing witness that I'm not lying. And then he brings in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is affirming that what my conscience is saying is correct. That my conscience is judging correctly. Okay, so these are two separate entities. If my conscience was the Holy Spirit, well, who does the Holy Spirit reside in? Every single believer. So if the conscience was the Holy Spirit, all of us would have a, collect a collective conscience, and thus, why are things different among us? Why would we even need a Romans uh, 14? Why would we need a 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10? Because that seems to indicate differences. Yeah, it's because our conscience is not the Holy Spirit. So all these points of, of uh, clarification so that we can define what it actually is, what the conscience actually is, by where it is, and whose it is. So the conscience, as we can see, where it dwells is in the immaterial being. It is judging things in our immaterial being our thoughts, our intentions, our motives. That's where it is. So what it is becomes clear by, it's guilty by association. Interesting choice of words. But it's, its association is mind, emotions, and will. Well, those mainly are a faculty of the immaterial heart. So what is the conscience? It's a faculty of the immaterial heart. It's sitting inside of you. It's not something you and I could uh, slice someone open and say, oh, there's the conscience. Any more that we could slice open a person and say, there's the mind, there's the emotions, and there's the will. Okay? I hope that helps in saying, this is what it is. This is where it is. Now, it helps us with whose is it? Whose it is? Whose is it? It's, it's yours. It's uniquely every single individual in here. As uniquely as God made you, you are uniquely yours and you have a unique conscience. And so no two people are going to have exactly the same conscience. By the way, that's not what we should be striving for, that we all have the same conscience. We want to be conformed into whose image? Christ's, not each other's. We are not the standard, Christ is. So we want to be conformed into him his image. But, but we shouldn't be concerned about, we have so many differences. Yes, we do. And God uniquely made you the way you are. Because he uniquely is going to glorify himself in, in these differences. And how we love each other in our differences. I hope you heard that time and time and probably tirelessly again from, from Ken as we went through Romans 14. So how about we get to a definition? And that's, that's what slide we have up here. Here's a working definition. What is the conscience? The innate faculty of the immaterial heart that instinctively judges the attitudes, thoughts, words, and actions of a person according to the standards given to it by God, human authorities, and that have been personally acquired. Okay, so next slide. Let's break this down because I know I'm using some words that 
we don't use often. Innate. Innate. What's innate mean? It means that it's inborn. This isn't something that is learned. It's something that is born within us. Who birthed it? God did. God made it in us. When did you get it? From the moment you were a person, you got it. So if you're a parent and you've got a newborn baby, guess what? They have a conscience. They have a conscience. And you are helping to develop it. Okay, good luck. <laughs> All right. That's, fortunately, that's not where God leaves us, right? You have a huge responsibility, very important one, right? So the conscience is innate. It's inborn. It's in us. Just as we are image bearers of God, Genesis 1, 26, 27, John 4, 24. Where do we see it? Well, let's flip to our Bibles. Let's find the word conscience. No, 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 no. Actually, let's look for the effects of the conscience. And if we look for the effects of the conscience, we're going to find it very early on because it's in Genesis 2. Where do I see it in Genesis 2? Where's, where's conscience? Genesis 2, 15 through 17, what's God doing? He's instructing Adam. He says, do this, don't do this. Do that, don't do that. What's he doing? What's God doing? He's binding Adam's conscience. He's binding his conscience. It's there. It was there from day one. It was there from, with the first man. It was there with the first woman. And we see the uh, negative effects of the conscience first show up in Genesis 3 when Adam disobeys God. And what do we see? Guilt, shame, fear. Where's it coming from? Their conscience. It's where it's coming from. Wow. It, it's all the way back there? Yes, it's all the way back there. And so you and I have an innate conscience. Next thing is our conscience instinctively judges. Okay, what's instinctively judges mean? It, it means we don't have to tell it how to judge. It already knows. Did you have to teach your cat to be selfish? No, I, I didn't. Um, or, or your kids to lie. No, because it's instinctive. There's something instinctive to it. There's something else driving that, right? For, for my kids to lie, all they need is a sin nature, and they'll do just fine all by themselves. We have to teach our kids not to lie. We have to teach our kids to tell the truth. And we have to teach our kids that they need Jesus Christ. So it's instinctive. It functions absent of our will and our mind telling it what to do. It's its separate entity. This is important because if it were in the mind, how would I intentionally judge myself? I'm, and am I a very good judge of myself? We'll see how good of a judge we are of ourselves later. So it instinctively judges. It judges the way God intended it to do. And then, um, next slide. How does it judge? What does it use? So here's where we are going to get some clarification. It judges based upon law books that are in the mind. I don't know if you recall. We'll, we'll emphasize it later. You saw these arrows pointing to mind and emotions from the conscience. You may have noticed that there was this kind of glowy red line from the mind to the conscience. Well, the conscience, all it is, is a judge. Well, a judge needs laws. And those laws are not stored in the conscience. Those laws are in the mind. And it uses the mind to draw its law books. I find it fascinating that the American structure of government is, is basically built the way we are in our immaterial beings. We have three branches of government, don't we? 
One is the judiciary. One is the legislative. Maybe I'm giving you an education. I don't know. It's, so the judiciary is supposed to do what? Judge based upon what? The laws. Well, where are the laws coming from? From the judiciary? Well, nowadays it feels like it. <laughs> but it's not supposed to be that way. The judge is supposed to judge based upon the laws created by the legislative branch. They're supposed to create the laws, not the executive branch, by the way, by the legislative branch. So they make the laws, the judges rule according to the laws, and then the executor, the executive branch, is supposed to uphold and execute the laws of what the judges rule or not rule. Okay? So our consciences are the judge. It's a separate entity. And this is why it's important for us to understand where, where these law books are kept is in the mind. Because you and I, from a mind perspective, we can change things. That's why we talk about um, changing our consciences, making them sharper, uh, letting things go, bringing things in. Where is that happening? It's not in the conscience. It's actually in the mind. That's where it's happening. And there's four main law books in the mind. What are they? Oh, by the way, Titus 1.15, it links mind and conscience together by it, it, where, where it talks about defiled people and it says both their mind and their conscience are defiled. Oh, why does it matter that their mind is defiled? What he's saying is he's corrupted both the judge and the laws. That's what's happened. You corrupt, corrupt both the judges and the laws, what hope is there for you, right? Corrupt societies are out there and we know them, we see them, and what are they? Judges that have been paid off, legislators that have been paid off. And it's just running rampant. Okay, so we see a link there, but we get four law books. Um, the law that is written in the heart, that's in Romans 2, 14 through 15, by the way. We see that. We talk about the Gentiles who have the law written in the heart. Well, how do they instinctively know what's right or wrong? It's something that God stuck there. And then uh, another law book is the scriptures as we know them and study them. A, a unbeliever would have very little, if, if uh, not none of this, but we as believers are told 2 Timothy 2.15 to do what? Study to show ourselves approved. We need, we need to be binding we need to have it in our minds. What is right? What is wrong according to God's holy word? A third one, we saw it in Romans 13, 1 through 7, where God said, obey authorities. And he said, do this, why? For conscience sake. For conscience sake. It's right there in the text. And he says, obey authorities. Well, what, what, what authorities? Well, in the, in the clear context, it's um, governmental authorities. But how about husbands to... Husbands and wives. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, a very favorite of our current culture. And in, in, uh, the call for wives to submit to your husbands. Um, in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, children are instructed to obey their parents. That's, a, that's an authority. Um, in Ephesians 6, 5 through 8, employees are instructed to obey their employers. That's, a, that's another authority. Hebrews 13, 17, um, there are church leaders. They are also authorities. So this is God saying, obey authorities. Obey authorities. Why, God? For your conscience sake. For your conscience sake. Obey these authorities. So you got four law books in your mind. So only this last, uh, and then we got a fourth one, personally acquired standards. We, uh, we see this in Romans 14, 22 through 22. Three. And usually when we talk about quote-unquote conscience issues, we are zeroing in on book number four, if you will. Law book number four, which is my personally acquired standard. When in fact there's three other books. And they're from God. And so it's, my conscience will condemn me not only on whether or not I, I think it's okay to wear open-toed shoes. Right? That's a personally acquired standard. But it will also condemn me whether or not I love people. My conscience will condemn me. And we say, well, that's not a conscience issue. Okay, it is a conscience issue in the sense that 
Your conscience will condemn you for disobeying the law of Christ. It will. Well, thank God for it. We'll see. That's, it's a, that's a blessing. So it's just this last one that's in Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. So these personally acquired standards are important too. I don't want to violate my conscience on these personally acquired standards. Well, that's goofy. What if I'm condemned about coloring outside the line on my adult coloring book? Well, go talk to the joker who made that law. That would be you. If, that's, if your conscience so condemns you that you are coloring outside the line of your adult coloring book, you're sinning against God. You are. You are sinning against God because you have bound your conscience to that. If you think it's silly, then you need to, Romans 14, 22, 23, change it and be able to color outside the lines by faith. I know it sounds silly, but this is the way our conscience works. And this is how we keep it and maintain it unto good. If you've bound it to that, you have bound it to that. And to unbind it is to do so by faith, entrusting ourselves to God in these things. All right, so next line. We've got a, we've got a definition. I'm not necessarily expecting you to remember all of this. Again, this is recorded. You can get, get to this online. You can also ask for a refresher this uh, evening if you want. All right, so our next line. We're gonna, I'm going to take us from kind of from left to right here. That arrow pointing to those things that are happening to us. There's that big blue one that says, what's happening to me? So this can be all kinds of things um, that are happening to me, like temptations. Um, physical and emotional pain and suffering can happen to me. Hurtful words and actions, these can happen to me. So these enter into the immaterial heart, and then decisions are made with respect to to our minds as we consider that now drive emotions that, that will drive will. And as those things, all within, kind of within the context of the mind, as all of this is happening, as I'm thinking and considering, guess what the conscience is doing? In parallel, as I'm thinking and considering and deciding, the conscience is judging. Good, 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 no. And it's, what is it doing? It's pulling down from the law books and it's saying, according to those law books, is that correct? Is that correct? Is that correct? Is that correct? That's what it's doing. That's how it's functioning. So next slide. So that's, that's our pull. That's what it's doing. And I've got these, I don't know if you can tell, they're green arrows to kind of show a positive outcome. So on this slide, we see what happens when good choices are made. The conscience urges emotions of joy and peace in the heart, urging confidence and a desire to draw near to God. That's, that's when the conscience has given us the thumbs up, good job, good job, yes, yes, yes. These are positive things. And so then those positive, immaterial things in the heart can go out as responses that our, that our brain is then going to react to. And so say, boy, when I did that good thing, I had a warm, fuzzy feeling. Well, good. That warm, fuzzy feeling is just the physiological effect of a good decision in your immaterial being that said, boink, good job. Way to go. Feeling of joy, a feeling of peace, a desire to draw near to God. All right, next slide. What about negative? Now we got our red arrows. So we see what happens when we make bad choices. The conscience urges emotions of guilt in the heart, causing fear and a desire to hide from God. Where did we first see that? Hmm, I don't know. Genesis 3? Right. Remember Adam and Eve? They were naked, they were ashamed, so they put fig leaves on, hid their nakedness, problem solved. No, because all they were doing was trying to solve an inside problem with an outside solution. So they put on the fig leaves and they still didn't feel quite right and they heard the sound of the Lord in the garden and they were excited to see him. 
No, they were terrified. So they hid themselves. I was afraid, so I hid myself. Why were you afraid? Oh, you're naked? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? The woman is the woman whom you gave me, I might add. <laughs> Eve, what'd you do? Oh, it was the snake. It was the snake. And guess what? We're doing the same thing today. We love when our conscience judges us with that guilt, that sense of fear, that desire to run away, it's got to be someone else's fault. Let me go talk to somebody so they can tell me that because my mom didn't zip me up right in my snow gear, that's why I've got this problem. Clearly. This is how the conscience functions. We also see this in Psalm 32. 3 through 4, where David, after a sin with Bathsheba, says, when I kept silent about my sin. What happened? Response. My body wasted away. It affected him physiologically. That immaterial guilt, that fear, that shame was driving him, and it affected him, physio it affected him physiologically. So, this does beg a question. Nate, that sounds like condemnation. And I read in Romans 8.1 that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why am I feeling condemned? Something's off. Well, in Romans 14.23, we read that the conscience condemns us. And the whole context is talking about believers read it. It's talking about brothers. It's talking about our stance before the Lord. The whole context is believers. So how do I reconcile condemnation and condemnation? They're two different types. Romans 8.1 is talking about a judicial condemnation. Romans 14.23 is talking about a familial condemnation. And I want to do this just by way of illustration, just to illustrate this, okay? You got a guy who sees an orphaned, horrible, ugly, mean, nasty child on the street. And he picks up that horrible, mean, nasty child and he says, I am going to adopt you. You will be my child. And he cleans up the kid and he brings him in and he, through the legal system, adopts this child. One day this child decides he doesn't like the clothes he's wearing and goes to his adopted father and he says, I don't like what you have dressed me in. I think this is horrible. I think you're a horrible person and I don't like you and stomps out of the room. Sound like your three-year-old? Fair enough. What is that? What, what's the status of that child? Are they now no longer a child of the father? Is that gone? No, they're still a child of the father. But is their, is their intimacy, is their closeness good? Or is it broken? See, that intimacy is broken. Now, what does the child need to do to restore it? Go back to dad, who is still dad, and say, I'm sorry, Dan, for being a fool. And, and there's, there's forgiveness and restoration of intimacy. So I'm giving you that illustration because I want you to see the difference between our judicial or justification standing before God. That's Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of your sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. There is nothing you need do to earn your way back to God ever. It's all done in Jesus Christ. That's your judicial standing. But you and I, as we live the Christian life, can make decisions that are bad ones, poor ones. We can choose not to love. We can choose 
to violate our, our personally acquired standards. We can choose to disobey governmental authorities. We can choose to do all of these things. Your judicial standing does not change. You're still a child of God. But here's the caveat. A child of God eventually comes to their senses and says, I'm an idiot. That was wrong. And we come back to God and we say, I'm sorry. I agree with you. I sinned. And what I just described to you is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us, give us our sins. And to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if I'm in this bad state, next line. What do I do? Well, I want to pursue keeping a good conscience. I can confess my sin. I can confess my sin. That's what confession is. I don't know if you heard it when, when uh, Ken preached it, but I'll say it again. Please hear me. If I've got a conscience that is condemning me, we have an answer. It's found in Jesus Christ. And according to 1 John 1, 9, all we do is agree. Not, not, well, I agree. No, no. We agree wholly and fully in heart. We agree with God. You're right, I was wrong. You're right, I was wrong. And he cleanses the conscience. He cleanses the conscience. Okay, so that's how it functions. How do I keep a good one? It, now that I know what it is, where it is, whose it is, how do we define it? How do I keep a good one? So a good conscience then, by definition, is one that does not condemn us, that does not judge us guilty. Um, we see that in both uh, Romans 2.15, um, 14.2, and Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who is forgiven of his sins. That's a clear conscience. So uh, we do this, and we do this in, in concert with walking by the Spirit. Right, Because we don't want to just legalistically be people that just keep laws. I'm a good little boy. I'm a good little boy. No. We obey God from the heart, keeping a good conscience by yielding to the guidance of the Spirit of God in us. So next slide. All right. Bad conscience. Oh, can you go back? Sorry, I didn't make this point. Thanks. In keeping this good conscience, um, I do need to be aware that as I'm studying the Word of God, I need to be looking at the things that are good and I need to be bringing those into my mind because I might not have something that my conscience should be registering and I'm not. And I need to, I need to bring that in. I need to add. I need to add to the law book. But in adding to the law book, guess what you also need to be aware of? You might need to subtract from the law book. What if I've got some legalistic standard that is keeping me from my brothers and sisters, this is causing me to be a judgmental person. Yeah, you, you need to make an adjustment there too because that needs to grow us in the law of Christ. Okay, quickly moving on. Sorry, I'm keeping you so long. Um, bad conscience then is the opposite. It's a conscience that judges me guilty and I need to not argue with it. That's, that's the blame shift aspect. It's the same as a, um, why, why, don't, why aren't batters the umpire? in a baseball game. I hear laughter. Why aren't batters the umpire at a game? I couldn't hit that. That was clearly a ball. No, no, that was fair. We need a third party that has nothing to do with the, the team saying strike, ball, fair, foul. We need somebody that does it. That's what our conscience is. Don't argue with your conscience. If you feel guilty, you are guilty. Um, there's no such thing as false guilt. You want to ask that question tonight, have at it. There's an answer for it. And it mainly has to do with Proverbs 14, 12, Proverbs 16, 25 that says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And Proverbs 21, 2 that says, every, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but God 
judges the motives. You and I are very poor judges of ourselves. That is why we have a conscience that is not based on our volition, our will. No, no, that was good. That was good. And the conscience is going, no, it wasn't. No, no, it was. And the conscience, no, it wasn't. No, no, it was, it was, it was, it was. And you can beat your fist on the judge's bench all you want. And the judge says, I've ruled. Go sit down. So what if I can't discern then if my conscience is right, I feel guilty, I don't know what it is that I did. Proverbs, 21, uh, Proverbs 12, 15 tells us that a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man seeks counsel. Go seek counsel. This is what discipleship is about. We've got a discipleship support ministry that helps with all kinds of aspects. Focus discipleship. I need critical help now. Or just regular, plain old discipleship. Get somebody in your life. Don't be your own assessor. Have someone else help you. Have a fellow Christian help you. So, when we disobey our consciences, we have a solution in Jesus Christ in 1 John 1, 9, slide 15. Please. A good conscience leads to a happy heart, guys. As we obey Christ, oh, the joy that it is. And conscience is a blessing from God. The conscience is a good, uh, is a good gift given to us for our good and for His glory. As unbelievers, it pushes us to know God and to find an answer in Jesus Christ. That's good. It pushes us to remain in the love of God as believers. And as believers, it pushes us to recognize when we are not acting in accordance with the calling with which we've been called, Ephesians 4. When it condemns us, it condemns us for our good in order to drive us back to God. When it approves us, it yields a sweet sense of joy and peace. It's a blessing from God. Our consciences are a massive blessing and gift from God. We want to keep a good conscience because we want those rich blessings from God. So I'll, I'll, I'll close with this anecdote from the life of Martin Luther. Martin Luther who brought the Protestant Reformation out of the Catholic Church, questioned the doctrine and practices of the Catholic Church in his thesis called the 95 Thesis in October of 1517. The Roman Catholic Church wanted Martin Luther to recant his view. The Diet of Worms of 1521 was an imperial assembly meeting of the Holy Roman Empire. It was convened to determine how authorities, both political and religious, should respond to Martin Luther's teachings. The Diet was held in Worms, Germany. Martin Luther had, had to appear before the emperor twice. Each time he was told to take back his teachings. Luther didn't see any proof against his thesis or views which would move him to recant. Martin Luther said, Unless I am convinced by the Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the Pope and the councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. Martin Luther's conscience was captive to the Word of God. After negotiations with Martin Luther and failed attempts to recant his view, the Pope excommunicated Martin Luther in 1521. Oh, that we would be a people of such great conscious, conscience conviction to be captivated and to hold our conscience swayed by the Word of God in such a way that we do no less than give Him the glory of which He is worthy as our Savior, and as our King. Will you bow with me in prayer? 
So God, I thank you that you're present. I thank you that you give us your word. God, would we, would the people of Southside Bible Church, would we be a people of good conscience? Not simply to garner praise, but Lord, to honor you that we will be, would, would be firm in your truth, in your word, in you, in who you are, that our love would be made manifest to others. As we look at others and look at their needs, and as we not worry so much about ourselves, but others, and your glory, that you might be exalted. God, make us a people of good conscience, I pray. In your precious son's name, Jesus, amen.